And in the context, and in the context of Thatcher, I'm going to tell my own, or rather her own parent joke, um, which I'm afraid wasn't as uh, quite as explicit as yours. Uh, and, but she was supposed to have done a skit on the Monty Python dead parrot sketch. And she tried to compare ele various elements of the Labour Party to a dead parrot, as you can imagine. And so she said the joke, she wasn't very good at jokes, so she didn't really understand um, what the reference was. And at the crucial point, she talked to a to one of our advisors, she said, this Monty Python, is he one of us? <laughs> so I'm afraid she didn't really pay that much regard to your profession, um, with regard to uh, you know, knowing where these jokes were coming from. But I wanted to say a few things about that. Well, obviously she was a, a remarkable person for some of my age, um, and I think for, for people now, um, I think people forget how extraordinary it was that a, a woman would be leader of the Conservative Party as long ago as 1975. And this was something which at the time um, caused a lot of uh, interesting remarks. And she was also particularly um, sensitive in, in many ways about this. But of course, one of the things that people have always pointed out is that she, she very rarely appointed women to her cabinet. She only appointed one woman in the whole of the 11 years. And Frank Field, who's a Labour MP, said to me, he said, you know, he spoke to her about this, and he, and he said, you know, Margaret, why aren't you, uh, and Frank was a junior MP at the time, said, Margaret, why aren't you appointing really good women uh, to the cabinet? And she said, it's very simple, Frank, they're just not good enough. And, 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 and he turned around and he said, you think the women aren't good enough? What about your men? <laughs> um, and of course, you know, that was very much something which uh, people noticed at the time. And of course, she wasn't very good at jokes. She was very, very straightforward. And what my book tries to describe in the six months in 1981 was that what was driving her was very much almost a kind of religious uh, fervor. I mean, she, she herself um, wasn't very upfront about her religious belief. We don't know what she believed theologically. But certainly her style was very much, this is what I argue, was very much informed by the fact that she was the daughter of a Methodist lay preacher. And so, like um, any lay preacher, like anyone who is informed by religion, um, the truths of religion are very simple. It's very, everything is black and white. Everything is binary. And so she reduced everything, uh, and that's, I think, what sustained her through 1981. And we've got to remember what happened in 1981. We had a, a very savage budget in March, which Geoffrey Howe introduced. And I'll say a few words about that later. So you had um, the formation of the SDP, um, you had the Irish uh, hunger strikes with Bobby Sands, uh, who died. you had Brixton and Toxteth riots, um, and of course she reasserted herself um, with the reshuffle in September uh, 1981, and that's where my book ends. And it's six months of defined leader. it shows her consistently sticking to her guns and making sure um, that she would somehow come out on top. She had incredible willpower. And of course, uh, humour, um, from her point of view, was something which was rather quite flippant. I mean, Geoffrey Howe described the, uh, the budget, and famously, you will probably remember, 364 economists um, wrote to the Times uh, after the budget, saying that the budget was completely wrong, it had no foundation in theory, it was all um, complete bananas and the, and the economy would, ruin, would be ruined. And Geoffrey Howard famously said, well, he had, he had a description of what an economist is. And he said, an economist is a, someone who knows 364 different ways of making love, but doesn't actually know any women. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, when Thatcher was told this, she was in complete incomprehension. Um, and she didn't understand what was going on. She just said, well, Geoffrey, they're just wrong. I don't care about... Um, what, what, they, what they think about making love. And uh, how realised that, you know, that the Prime Minister had a serious, in his view, um, sense of humour deficit. But actually, what was remarkable about 1981 wasn't the fact that she got through it or the fact that, um, you know, she managed to reassert herself. The fact is, is that at the time, everyone thought that Thatcher was going to be a short-lived uh, experiment. Uh, and one friend of mine who was working in central office, he's slightly older than I am, but he was working in central office in the 70s, um, was in the lift, and uh, Rab Butler came in to the lift. And he said, oh, this Thatcher business, we won't have to put up with that for very long, will we? And he said, well, let's see. And of 
course, was, that was in 1977, so it was another 30 years. Uh, and she long outlived, uh, well, her premise had long outlived um, Brad Butler's life, who he sadly passed away in 1982. So my book is really just showing how fragile, in many ways, her grip on the Conservative Party, her grip on, on power. And um, it shows really the, 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 a remarkable leader, because of, obviously from now, here, we see hindsight. We see that she did 11 years and she was at the top of her game. But in 1981, things were much more fragile. She was a, a leader who um, hadn't been tried and tested. She was someone who people thought was a short-lived experiment. But actually, the story of how she got through that, I think, is a remarkable testament to her qualities as a leader, regardless of what you think about. And it was a great privilege for me to research and write about this topic. And I, I just wanted to say, talking about Ireland, um, and I think I had to I have to share that. I mean, it's a real privilege for me to be at uh, an old military lunch. I've heard lots of good things about it. I've enjoyed sitting next to uh, Barry Crime. And, um, and talking about that, I just, I just thought that the one thing was, because I, I was a great fan, I grew up as a great fan of Spike Lilly, and I'd love to have been here when he was at, the, at these lunches. Anyway, uh, Barry, sorry to steal this uh, anecdote. Um, and I think it should be shared more widely. Anyway, Spike Milligan was at one of these lunches, and uh, he did his thing, he spoke very eloquently, very funnily. And he walked out, and someone said, um, someone, one of the audience came up to him and said, Oh, um, Mr. Milligan, I really, really would like to shake the hand of the greatest living Englishman. And Spike said, I'm Irish, now buzz off. <laughs> <laughs>